Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. The stresses of daily life, such as financial pressures, work deadlines, and family demands can produce fatigue, sleeplessness, and other physical conditions that can harm our overall health. An emerging practice to deal with these stresses is called mindfulness, an approach that raises awareness of your thoughts, your physical sensations, and your surroundings. Recent research has shown that such an approach can have important effects on our mental, emotional, and physical health. Proponents of mindfulness say that the practice of mindfulness can not only reduce stress and help improve health, but it can also be useful in managing chronic illnesses such as heart disease or arthritis, and can even be helpful in addressing addiction, substance abuse, and pain. This edition of Physician Focus will explore the concepts and practice of mindfulness and how the mind-body connection can affect our health. Our guests for this program are Dr. Michael Guidi and Dr. Jefferson Prince. Dr. Guidi is a board-certified family physician practicing in Haverhill. He is on the medical staffs of Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston and Anna Jakes Hospital in Newburyport. He is also chairman of the Massachusetts Medical Society's Committee on Student Health and Sports Medicine and is engaged in efforts to prevent youth substance abuse with particular attention to teaching mindfulness to students, teachers, and parents. Dr. Prince is a board-certified psychiatrist with a subspecialty in child and adolescent psychiatry. He is the director of child psychiatry and vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General for Children at North Shore Medical Center in Salem, and is an instructor in the Medical Center's mindfulness-based stress reduction program. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Ruth. Great to have you here. Um, let's start by simple definitions. What is mindfulness? Jeff, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so mindfulness really can mean several things. So in a historical way, it really can just be a dispositional quality, like I'm mindful, I'm a paying attention, I'm aware of what's going on. When we are talking about it in the clinical sense, like tonight, we really are talking about a formal practice. and. We really uh, look to John Kabat-Zinn, uh, and he says that what mindfulness is what comes out of paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And this is the practice when we talk about these applications and this interest in clinical medicine, that's the quality we're really talking about. And uh, Mike, uh, you apply this in a lot of situations. Um, are you saying that this is more of a, a lifestyle? How do you approach mindfulness in your practice? So with patients, I usually talk to them about living for today and focusing on today, not worrying about things that happened in their past, whether it be yesterday, last month, last year, and not being fearful of what might be coming in the future. So I explain to them that that is actually good to quiet your brain down. Um, and they listen to that and they have to figure out whether they want to do that. Uh, I think mindfulness uh, has to be taught over and over and over again. So if somebody comes in for a physical exam, I definitely mention it. And if somebody has a chronic disease such as diabetes or heart disease or hypertension, I might mention the fact that studies have shown, mindful studies have shown, even though they've been small studies, that blood pressures come down and heart rates come down. And they don't just come down for a half an hour, they can come down for a very long period of time. Right. Patients are really going to be paying attention no matter what. What we're talking about is teaching people a way that may be helpful, uh, a way of them paying attention. So as opposed to mindlessness or the usual habits, this is a way that may uh, people may really participate, uh, join in their health care so that in the middle of difficulties, uh, really whether they're medical um, or social or emotional, people can learn to train their mind to be with those difficulties in a way that may open up new possibilities instead of going and doing the same thing over and over again. And when we talk about being non-judgmental, <clears throat> that's a very important uh, <clears throat> focus because many of us, all of us in fact, can be very negative, critical about people and things around us. And when we're watching the television and we some, see some of these violent shows or we see a lot of the negative things that happen on TV such as the, the murders and, and uh, terrorism, et cetera, that can make us 
very negative. So the, the point is, if you can <clears throat> become non-judgmental, and you can't do that overnight, but if you can become non-judgmental and become more positive focused, then there's a lot less clutter in your brain that you have to think about. Right, and in, in addition to that, I would just say, especially with the difficulties, if we think about things like Paris, or we think about like in California, people are scared. There's a lot of things that generate fear, and our uh, people's tendencies are to be very reactive to that and to, to clamp down and to, um, um, really, because it's so scary. It's, close you just whole don't know body it, systems. It, yeah, that just to shut down and, and close down and get more tense, and if you will, to try harder. And mindfulness offers the space, if you will, not so much that we shouldn't be afraid, because maybe there's a reason to be afraid, but the more interesting thing is both to notice that I'm feeling afraid and to say, well, so now what? And it may open up some possibilities of ways of relating uh, to the fear or to the difficulty that aren't exhausting. So not being fearful, you know, the, the aware of the situation. Well, I would but even not. say as opposed to not being fearful, is it's a way to get through fear and um, as opposed so that I can be with all things, as Mike said, non-judgmentally. Another way to think of that might be is that if when I'm non-judgmental, I'm willing to be near all things, to be with things as they actually are, as opposed to how I would like them to be or how I expect or hope them to be, but by being with them as they are right now, it opens up new possibilities. So where did this movement begin? You know, there, uh, I'm sort of thinking with uh, Buddha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so John Kabat-Zinn, who I haven't met, but I've seen on television because he does some uh, uh, shows. And um, he, Anderson Cooper actually was on with him. He went to one of his uh, seminars in Northern California. Um, he uh, was a molecular biology student and graduated from MIT uh, with a PhD degree, then went to UMass Medical School in Worcester and started teaching mindfulness approximately 37 years ago. He's published significant amounts of data. He's written some terrific books. Um, it, it pretty much started with him, and I'm assuming that he got most of his information from the Buddhist teachings uh, of, the, of the past. Yeah, so I think uh, the, the practice of mindfulness really is, has, um, is articulated in Buddhism, but it's by no means Buddhist. And so that in really all con contemplative traditions, there's some form of mindfulness. It, and mindfulness really is paying attention. It's a, a, a way, a tone, a flavor of how I train the mind to pay attention. And it's, um, and John Kabat-Zinn uh, really articulated this and other folks like Herbert Benson around here um, really has have demonstrated that in fact it does decrease oxygen consumption. It does, uh, can lower blood pressure. I mean, he tells wonderful stories about sneaking people into the lab at Harvard in the late 60s because he was afraid they would sort of uh, treat him with chagrin if he was found out to have meditators. Um, so so it's, a, it's a way of training the mind to pay attention. And in, the, in this tradition, which is a little bit of a difference between Dr. Benson and Dr. Kabat-Zinn, um, Dr. Benson's, and in uh, meditative traditions, they're concentrative tr traditions where people sort of have an idea of emptying the mind. And then there are other ones which uh, mindfulness, as we're talking about, really comes out of mostly of being able to be with all things so that you train, we train the attention in a formal way but the training and attention is in order to develop more insight, to see things more clearly, to uh, access the energy that's already here, not to create new circumstances, but as a way of relating to what's here. So um, you've touched upon this a couple of times. What does the evidence show? Well, I'd like to What's, answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> then, I mean, everybody's just saying, oh, this is sort of funky stuff. Well, who, who knows what, what are these uh, docs up to here? So, so my, Mike, tell us what. So what, in, my, in my recent reading, and I've done a lot of reading, um, uh, and it's all very interesting reading, there's been over 200, excuse me, over 2,600 research studies uh, up until about 2014 many of them very small studies, many of them not randomized controlled. So when I say small studies, I mean 
10 people, 40 people, 120 people. So randomized control, of course, is the uh, gold standard. The gold standard, right. and uh, they're very expensive to do. Right. But so what did the studies show us? So basically, they have investigated many different uh, medical conditions, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress in uh, veterans, uh, cancer, uh, uh, emotions, cancer pain, uh, acute pain, chronic pain, uh, chronic diseases such as diabetes uh, and heart disease. And what most of the studies show is that people feel better. They're more relaxed. Uh, their brain's more relaxed. They feel perhaps more empathetic towards other people, more compassionate towards other people. The National Institute of Health in 2014 just uh, uh, put out uh, research in the, to the tune of $100 million, which, with, where they'll pay for research on mindfulness. So the federal government gets it. They know that mindfulness is for real. I think they also know that the current medical system is so expensive, so much technology, so much medicine, pills, surgery, et cetera. And they get the fact that if we can teach people uh, starting in, let's say, in kindergarten and all the way up to prevent some of these illnesses, to take better care of themselves, then there won't be so much illness. But using mindfulness to do this, one of the things that, that strikes me is um, a bunch of uh, conditions that we and, and the traditional techniques do not do well. I don't think we treat PTSD well. I don't think we actually get to the fundamentals of addiction well. And I understand that there's a, a fair movement to get um, mindfulness into the, the treatment of these conditions. Can you speak to that at all? Well, certainly so that uh, in terms of our current evidence base, there's really a, um, a we might think of mindfulness-based applications. And there are variety, various um, ways this has been presented. So one of them is with mindfulness-based cognitive therapies. And um, Mike mentioned uh, in, in anxiety and depression. Well, um, uh, really excellent studies from England and Canada have shown that for people who've had three or more episodes of major depression, that going through an eight-week long course uh, helps reduce the likelihood of a relapse into depression as much as uh, continuing to take medications. So, um, and it's not that it's better than medicine, it's just, it's different. It's it, offers, it offers uh, some choice, and, and different people have different ways that they want to, to treat their conditions, and this, this offers other, um, other ways. So, as opposed to being a replacement for things, it may be a way to complement and, and, and enhance people's health and their autonomy. Can you speak to PTSD as to... Uh, well, so certainly, so, so certainly there's, uh, in terms of PTSD... I, sh I should say post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, <laughs> certainly. So we've had, you know, a large sort of in-person experiment the last, you know, 15, 18 years, uh, mostly in the military. So there are a number of, of, of projects that have been done. So one are for folks and veterans coming back from war and from service um, who have a lot of difficulty challenge reintegrating um, from what they were doing into sort of where we live and how we live and they have a lot of symptoms so there's a lot of work that way and and the Department of Defense has actually developed although it's not military it's called mindfulness coach is an app that can train people and there's a, a good amount of data showing that for veterans uh, using uh, who've experienced traumatic uh, events that using mindfulness is a way to uh, develop a new relationship as opposed to being reactive to develop one that may be proactive and protective. The, uh, another group of, uh, of studies have looked at really how do we help the families, family members who are left behind when their loved ones go, uh, go abroad and, and serve our country. And so uh, that's a very stressful experience, always worrying and, and um, um, 
so that there have been data showing that we can in fact teach them how to mindfully relate to this uncertainty. And that's really what we're teaching is how to relate mindfully to uh, conditions that are uncertain. I can add one more piece of information on PTSD. I had a patient, without giving his name away, who was an Afghan, uh, Afghanistan veteran. And he came home and he was having a lot of trouble. And he was married at the time and he had one young child and he had a job. And uh, his problem, one of his problems was he would drive down the local highway and he would swear there was a bomb ready to go off uh, next to the highway. Now, none of us would ever feel that way, but we, none of us have been to Afghanistan and we haven't been shot at, etc. So he got treated with sertraline. I treated him with sertraline, probably 50 milligrams, maybe up to 100. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember. But I taught him, in effect, mm -hmm. what was mindfulness, but I didn't know it at the time that I was mm -hmm. teaching him that. So I was teaching him to focus, relax. I was teaching him empathy, which is what we all do for our patients, hopefully, compassion, and he did marvelously well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about treating substance abuse with this? Because uh, this is another relapsing condition that uh, we tend to uh, treat chemically and uh, not always successfully. Yeah, well, so certainly, so w within all addictions, and we can certainly look at chemical addictions, alcoholism, uh, the opiate crisis that we're all experiencing, and it has uh, a number of roots, and, and addictive behaviors really come out of, of trying to do the same thing over and over again and, and expecting different results, or in trying to avoid, uh, avoid something. So uh, mindfulness may provide some space, both either for those um, who are interested in uh, seeking a new way, or the people who look after them. And so that uh, uh, addiction, again, is full of uncertainty, it's full of distress, um, and I, I would think of distress as what people experience internally, and it's full of stress, and those are things that people experience externally, sort of a, an interactional system. So mindfulness has a way, and in fact, um, at the, through North Shore, we taught at the Recovery High School in Beverly and um, taught both the students at the Recovery, North Shore Recovery High School. And we also had a class for the parents, many of whom of the students at, at North Shore Recovery High School, as well as uh, members of a, a group called Learn to Cope, which is a, a support group for families who have uh, family members with addiction. Extraordinarily stressful. And um, so there are a number of ways we might apply and, mindfulness. And you know, you should uh, uh, celebrate the fact that you're quite successful at this, you know, that the, the success rates on, on addiction are, are not all that high. And as I mm -hmm. understand the numbers from your group, they were uh, uh, exceeded that by quite a margin. Well, we, we you know, people, uh, people find what, uh, they want to do what's practical and what's helpful and what, what uh, feels good and, um, uh, and, and increases their ability, really gives them choices. And, um, you know, I, we find, or in our experience really, in our work is that as people's choices increase, like we all like to have choices, the more choices we have, the better people feel. So, Mike, you were hitting on some uh, real practical aspects of this and how you actually deal with this with uh, patients. Can you uh, probably expand on that a little bit and tell us about so the, how it might happen in your practice? Sure. So I'd like to speak for the substance abuser, the heroin substance abuser. These people are pretty decent people. Now, there are some people that break the law and they, and they don't have much regard for humanity, but most of them, by and large, are pretty decent people who kind of got trapped in uh, injecting heroin. They didn't start that way, and they never ever thought they'd get there. But the one thing I'd like to say on behalf of all those people, and there's a lot of them in this country, is they feel that we stigmatize them. Doctors, nurses, medical personnel, they feel stigmatized. And I understand why that happens. But if you're going to do mindful training for these people, you had better not stigmatize them. So one example is the young gentleman who works, has a family, he's a great guy, he's a patient of mine. He goes into the emergency room with some other issue, medical issue. The nurse is being very nice to him, being very attentive, until he tells her that he's taking Suboxone, and then the mood mm -hmm. changes. So I would just like to point out to any medical professional who's going to treat these folks or deal with these folks at work or at, or at home or wherever, please uh, be 
Treat them with respect. Be because, mindful. Be mindful. Because right. they don't get better unless you do that. And I will tell you, and Jeff knows better than I do, they get a lot better if you treat them right. Yeah. And, and, and so I would just add a little bit, if I can, to that, because they're very related to the, the use of opiates and our, our ways to try to address pain um, medically. Um, is it, it, that's often a way in for many people to use, o, use or misuse or abuse opiates because their pain is real. And we often don't have uh, an effective uh, method to show people how to be with their pain in a way that, um, that uh, is healthy. And so, you know, we, we in hospitals, we, before we've asked, you know, sort of how's your pain? What's your pain scale? Right? as if the expectation is that you're not supposed to have pain. As opposed to now there's a, a, a lot of change where people ask, well, how manageable is your pain? And so that's really a mindfulness practice is how manageable is this? And depending on um, where your answer lies based on your resources at that moment and those circumstances, that'll determine, that'll lead you to be able to respond in a way that's in line with things that are important to you, with your own value. Um, we were talking before about the use of um, mindfulness in dealing with pain as um, in some ways a replacement to opiates. Uh, I have a bunch of patients who are chronic pain patients that take, uh, you know, through the 90s when we were supposed to treat pain as the fifth vital sign, uh, we've gotten their on the medical side, we've gotten their doses up high and now we're discovering you know, maybe that's not the best way to treat their pain. So how do we come back from that brink and, uh, and start using mindfulness to uh, uh, supplement our, our other uh, uh, chemical treatments of, of chronic pain? So education is a very big piece here because you really need to spend the time with the patient even though we're very busy and we don't feel like we have the time, you educate them on what the drug is, how it works, and what the alternative drugs are, and what the alternative are to medicines. So deep breathing techniques, a lot of the techniques that you will learn in a mindfulness class, and those, those are offered in Salem, and those are offered in Worcester and a lot of other places. But I think education of the, of the patient as to why do you need this drug? How does it work? And maybe you don't need this drug and I'd like to try this. And, and the reason I want to try this is because I think this will be better for you. Explaining how narcotics cause tolerance. If you take them long enough, they stop working. They, they go from a, from a pain, controlling pain to increasing euphoria. So of course a person who is euphoric, who's happy, is going to, going to want to take that drug. But it's our job not to get them addicted to these drugs and, and, and we need to be educated as well before we start prescribing these, these well, Also the euphoria is very short lived and just leaves you searching for more euphoria uh, rather than pain relief. Chasing the high. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, in, in some other, who, who does this apply to? This is right across the board. And well, so I would say that it applies to uh, patients to their family members, caregivers. So um, there's a lot of caregiver stress. We see a lot of uh, families that uh, mindfulness may have application who have family members suffering from dementing conditions. Um, and again, that can be an extraordinarily difficult uh, um, circumstance. And it's, uh, in mindfulness, we teach that we don't really need anything else. It's a way of learning to relate to the things that are already there. And, and the aim, and I, I really want to emphasize this, like with the pain, it's not to replace necessarily a medicine, but to improve people's ability, their capacity, to relate to the circumstances of their lives in a way that is in line with their intentions and with their values. And as Mike had mentioned previously about people feeling um, compassionate towards themselves, I, would, I like to use the word uh, towards other people, but really it, it's first to feel more friendly or at least less unfriendly towards yourselves. Often our patients, our students in mindfulness, the, the people they feel and think about the most harshly are themselves. So where do we sign up? 
<laughs> I, you know, I, you know it's, it's wonderful. So if, if you're somebody in the viewing public, where do you sign up? I think a good place to start is with some of uh, John um, Kabat-Zinn's Kabat uh, books. Uh, where you go, there you are. Mm -hmm. uh, full catastrophic. Uh, yeah, and the, the, uh, the, he's the emeritus of the, head of the uh, Center for Mindfulness at UMass, and he and Saki Santarelli and Florence Melio Meyer, really, they have a wonderful website. So at UMass, that's a, a, a great resource to begin locally. And they actually have a list of where the programs, the mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, are offered really around our state and further places. And a second place would be to go uh, look into the Benson Henry Institute at Mass General Hospital. That sounds terrific. If we I could just say quickly, the Hahn Foundation, Goldie Hahn, H-A-W-N, out of yeah. California, um, mind up the program for uh, students uh, is a good is a good place. To we only have a few minutes left, not even. Uh, can you do you have some parting thoughts for us, uh, Mike? Do you want to start? So my emphasis right now is to educate children from kindergarten to grade twelve, mm -hmm. um, because all the educators that I listen to mm -hmm. say start early. Mm -hmm. So let's say that in the public school system in Massachusetts we allow all these students to get mindfulness training K through 12 and from middle school to high school uh, training in substance abuse. How do these drugs work? Does marijuana adversely defect, affect the developing brain? I think these kids and these parents need to know before we decide to approve the use of marijuana in this state. Um, so there's a lot of things like that that I'd like to do. However, if you educate the kids in school and they're perfectly mindful, and they go back to a home environment that's very bad, let's educate the parents too. Jeff, you have a well, short, short parting thought. A short parting thought. So mindfulness is both healing, and it may be helpful in making uh, us adapt well to the circumstances we face, and mindfulness is revealing, and it may reveal different uh, possibilities for us. Well, thank you both, uh, Dr. Mike Guidi and Dr. Jeff Prince. Thank you. Great. It's terrific to be here. Yeah, thanks, sir. For more information on mindfulness and the mind-body connections, visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Melissa Wood. And I'm Dr. Nandita Scott. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming nearly 400,000 lives each year, more than all cancers combined. Yet nearly half of women are unaware that heart disease, along with stroke, pose the biggest threats to their health. It is important that women recognize their risk factors for heart disease. Amongst the biggest risks are family history and age. Heart disease that has affected a brother, sister, father, or mother is a particular concern, and the risk rises as we get older. The good news is that many other risk factors can be controlled with lifestyle changes. Keep your blood pressure and cholesterol in check, don't smoke, eat a healthy diet, exercise, and maintain a healthy weight. We urge you to talk with your healthcare provider and get screened to determine your risk of heart disease. For more information, visit the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Goodman. Raising a happy, healthy child is every parent's priority. When your child has a fever or is injured, it's easy for parents to seek medical attention. It's not so easy when kids don't want to do homework or engage at school, are withdrawn or cranky, and tough to connect with, all of which could be normal or could be signs of mental illness. 
Mental health problems such as ADHD, depression, and anxiety are common among children and youth. In children, these problems often look different than they do in adults. So it's important that parents be aware of warning signs that can indicate mental health problems. Look for relationship problems with peers or family members, trouble fulfilling responsibilities like homework and daily chores, a drop in school performance, or mood changes that last for weeks. If you observe any of these signs, talk with your child's pediatrician. For more information, visit the American Academy of Pediatrics at HealthyChildren.org.